The following program is a UWTV classic. University of Washington in Seattle, Upon Reflection. Hello and welcome to Upon Reflection. I'm Marsha Alvar. The Northwest has long been known as a region of readers, but in recent years it's also become known as a haven for writers. One of the newest voices to emerge from the Northwest's growing literary community is Kathleen Alcala. Alcala is assistant editor of Seattle Review and co-founder of the multicultural art journal Raven Chronicles. Author of Mrs. Vargas and the Dead Naturalist, a highly praised collection of short stories, Alcala's newest book is her first novel, Spirits of the Ordinary, a tale of Casas Grandes. And welcome to Upon Reflection. Thank you, Marcia. Why don't we begin by having you tell the story that you tell in this novel? The story of Spirits of the Ordinary is about a man and wife who live in northeastern Mexico in the 1870s. He wants to go out into the wilderness and look for gold, and she doesn't want him to. And so they go separate ways and end up each doing things that neither of them would predicted with their separate lives. It's a, it's a wonderful story and, and quite complex in that you're working with a lot of characters. And I wonder how much control you have as a writer over these people you create or whether they sort not of take off much. on their own. <laughs> right, not very much. Uh, I did a lot of historical research for the novel um, based on my own family's background and the characters were originally based on my great-grandmother and my great-grandfather. But by the time the characters had created themselves they were entirely different people. <laughs> You uh, took a trip to Mexico in 1990 that I know is yes. very important in terms of how this book was grown and, and shaped. And people actually have kind of an interesting opportunity to go on that trip with you because a journal that you kept is part of Sheila Bender's book, um, right. The Writer's uh, Journal. The Writer's Journal. In that excerpt that's, that's in Sheila Bender's uh, collection, you said that even though you had been to this part of Mexico many times, spent part of every year of your childhood there, that somehow you knew this trip was different, that it was going to be special in some way. Yes, there were two reasons for that. Uh, one was that I knew that I was working on this novel, and so for the first time I was going back with perhaps a more objective eye and kept a journal for the first time. I've, I've never consciously kept a journal as a writer. The other was that I knew that it would be a sort of first and last time for many things. I took my five-month-old son to visit my relatives. I felt that that was really important. It was a sort of baptism back into Mexico. We called it a baptism of dust, which yes, is a wonderful phrase. Uh, of taking him and showing him to my family. And my uncle at that time was, was very old and unwell, and I knew that that would be the last time that I would see him. Hmm. What were you looking for? in terms of research? I think for research I was looking primarily for ambiance. I had a choice of either going to Saltillo, Mexico, where I still have some very distant relatives, but people who haven't the faintest idea who I am. <laughs> and I have my relatives who I'm very close to in Chihuahua, Mexico, so I opted for the living relatives because the, the two cities are fairly difficult to get to and I couldn't visit them both in the same trip. So I went just remembering what the streets were like and the architecture and the feel and the rhythm of life in Mexico, how people relate to each other, which is very different from the United States. And the other thing which I didn't realize would be so important until I got there was access to my uncle's library, which turned out to have some fabulous finds in terms of research for this novel. And the, and the library actually becomes almost a character. In yes, the library itself tends to become a character and I, I borrowed from it for Julio's library who is a hidden Jew in the novel. He's, he's Zacharias' father and spends a lot of time in his, li his secret library where he studies and meditates upon the Kabbalah. How much research did you have to do about the history of Jewish life in Mexico? 
Once I kind of knew what I was looking for, it turned out not to be that difficult. My family had said just very much in passing, oh yes, we're descended from Jews, but I had never made that link to uh, the Inquisition and the diaspora, the Spanish diaspora that happened in 1492, almost on the same wave with, with Columbus leaving to discover the New World. So once I was able to pin that down, I found some information in my uncle's library. I found a whole book in Spanish by Boleslao Lewin that's about Jews under the, under the Inquisition in the New World. And then I was also able to travel to San Antonio, Texas that summer and use the Institute of Texas Cultures archives, which had a, quite a bit of information. Mm -hmm. And they're the amazing and really rather ghastly stories are included yes, in this Yes, they are. And in some ways, I thought, well, here's a whole Mexico that I hadn't really thought about, but I guess I must have known underneath that those things were there, that, that um, the language and prejudice that are built into current language in, in Mexico in terms of derogatory terms for Jews and everything had a basis in the Inquisition. And like many persecutions, the um, Inquisition was only used against people for political or economic reasons. Mm. And so for years and years, for hundreds of years, people would, leave, would live their lives with their neighbors unmolested. But then if something came up, if there was some sort of disturbance, people would look and say, oh, well, it must be their fault. Let's do something about it. Mm. There's a, a passage in the book where a Catholic priest named Father Newman uh, is being described by someone else uh, who, who describes Catholicism in this book as a religion of faults. Yes. Th and that it had to do with power and that the more faults the church was able to find in its followers, the more power that gave the church over its followers. Right. This was a, a sort of capsule explanation of Catholicism <laughs> given by one non-Catholic from the United States to another who was about to travel south into the territories of, of Texas and northern Mexico. Mm -hmm. The faith is an important theme in this book, faith of various it's sorts. It's very important. And it's, it's one of the reasons I asked you to read uh, the passage that I hope you're going to read yes. for us uh, now. And it, it has to do with this family practicing, practicing its faith in a clandestine Right. Manner. Again, um, the husband who is interested in looking for gold is from a family of secret Jews, and his father and, and mother still practice. His mother does not speak. Um, she was left mute by a childhood trauma having to do with being Jewish. As dusk approached, Mariana hung heavy cloth over the windows that faced the street. She knew that they were not the only ones who did this, but everyone was discreet. Certain families were simply not seen on Friday evening, no matter how balmy the weather, how sweet the blossoms, or how dewy the air. She then draped a dark mantilla over her head. Julio stood at one end of the table, a yarmulke folded in his hands. He did not place it on his head until Mariana began to light the candles. Julio watched his wife carefully as her mouth shaped the unspoken words of the Hebrew prayers. Amen, he said. Amen. They had performed this ritual in near silence for so many years that he no longer knew if even he could say the prayers aloud. They had had no daughter to learn the woman's part of the Shabbos only Zacharias. Against his will, Julio glanced to the place where their son used to stand. They always celebrated Shabbos standing up. It was easier to snuff the candles and put away the yarmulke and prayer shawl if someone appeared at the door with a sudden knock. Mariana motioned three times over the candles, her still beautiful face lit by the wavering light, her silent lips repeating the ancient ritual in the glowing light between them. It is not dead, thought Julio. No matter what they say, our religion is not dead. Each Shabos, he felt it recreated, reformed in the simple, beautiful prayers that united God to home, home to family, and family to God. Julio blessed the bread and wine before he removed his yarmulke and prayer shawl, and they took their chairs. With the windows covered, Julio and Mariana had not seen the suddenness with which dusk descended on Saltillo. Distant thunder now rolled towards them from the west, 
followed quickly by sheets of rain that drummed upon the roof and caused the gutters to flow and gurgle like many voices. They ate their meal in silence. Then Mariana carefully wrapped the white Chabos candles in blue cloth and removed the hangings from the windows one by one. Mm. It's a wonderfully atmospheric piece of writing where you really get the sense of what it sounds like to be in the room, what it feels like to be in the room, and what's outside of the room. Yes. One of the themes that I was interested in exploring in this book was the rela relationship of people to place and how it would feel to be essentially people in exile in the new world, even if you had lived, your family had lived there for many generations. And um, the fact that their son wanted to be out in this new world, and, and Julio, the father himself, sees this still as somewhat of an alien place. I spoke to a researcher in Tucson last year who said something very interesting, an um, ethno-historian at um, the Arizona State Museum. And he said, most traditional cultures are tied to landscape. The landscape itself is sacred. The mountains are sacred. The rivers are sacred. But the Jews, when their religion came into being, were already in exile. And what they made sacred was the word. And so they had the Ten Commandments that were car carved in stone, which is still heavy to carry around, but it's <laughs> portable. So their relationship to God and their identity was something that they could take with them wherever they went. Mm -hmm. And so the Jews were able to successfully bring this identity and this culture with them to the New World. One of the traditions that you write in, um, not particularly reflected in the passage that, that I asked you to read, but is magical realism. And it's a phrase that's used a great deal, but I still don't really understand it completely. Right. And, and its origins, where it came from, and why it seems to be so interwoven in Latino literature. When I first started writing, I think that my style of writing was drawn from the way that stories were told in my family. Family history was told this way. So when I started putting my interpretation of these stories on paper, people looked at me and said, oh, you're writing magic realism. You like, write like Garcia Marquez or Borges. And so I had to start writing down these names. And I never really saw anyone deal with that term until the Intamon Theater staged a production of Blood Wedding by Garcia Lorca, who is a Spanish writer. And there was a description of it and a list of writers in the program. And I thought, oh, well, here's some background that I can work with. But still people... Um, have a lot of def different definitions of it. I think that it grew out of cultures that were politically and socially repressive. And so people had to find a roundabout way of telling the truth that was more truthful than the way that they could really say it. So instead of saying, your grandfather was killed by the dictator who is still in power, they would say, long ago, in a country very much like ours, there was a man very much like your grandfather who went to visit the evil ogre in his castle. Mm. The best single definition that I have seen of magic realism, oh, actually I heard it on National Public Radio, was by Ariel Dorfman. And he said, people who have nothing but demand everything, that's real magic. Mm. And there's a description that you used, again, in the, uh, the writer's journal excerpt about uh, Magic realism is past and present mixing together, um, that it's faith and science. I mean, that you, what right. do you rely on to know what's real? Is it your faith? Is it right. proof? And I all of that's very confusing. Very mixed together. And I think in other cultures that faith and belief in the invisible is as powerful as science and logic is in this country. And so even when one spends a little bit of time in Mexico or Latin America, unless you can sort of let go of that notion that everything is going to be very logical, you're not going to have a very good time. <laughs> and you're not going to understand how people are acting around you. You're not going to connect with them because they're living their lives on a very different basis. Hmm. That's also true of readers. I mean, you have to, as a reader of this book, let go of some That's moorings right. that you generally have. And there was one reviewer, um, 
who who clearly didn't want to do that and uh, and said that magic real I've d described it as a, as a kind of albatross that uh, Latino right. writers if feel could, like they have to lug around <laughs> with them and use all the time. If I could just get over magic realism, <laughs> I might be a good writer. And I guess all I can say is I didn't sit down and say, oh, I'm going to write a work of magic realism now. This is just the way that these stories develop. And many of the incidents in the novel that may seem more preposterous are in fact based in very real events in Mexico around the turn of the century. Uh, again, people often will turn to an individual when their own uh, political and economic rec repression becomes so great, they will look to people for miracles. Sort and of a messianic will, leader yes. as Zacharias becomes in this right. book. And they will seek out these people and make them into leaders. One of the things I was interested in exploring with this book was the notion of I think that there are two kinds of heroes. There's the sort of hero who can take advantage of a situation, who we see as a natural born leader. And there's another kind of a hero who's the sort of person who attracts people's hopes and expectations. And so they will project onto him or her their own needs in the world. And that was the sort of person I wanted to write about. It's much more difficult because he tends to be somewhat passive he takes on these attributes that people will project on him. Mm. So Becomes what people have imagined right. him so to Zacharias, be. So um, Zacharias, his father has great expectations of him that he's unable to live up to, and so he runs away from them. But then the widow successfully projects her needs and desires on him, both sexually and economically, in, in that he helps her construct her bakeries. And then when he goes out to Casas Grandes, the people there are drawn to him, and he finds that he, in fact, does possess powers more mm. greater than he is able to understand. There is magic in the world. There are, you mentioned other characters. There are a great many more uh, also that we're going to have to leave for people to discover on their yes. own when they read the book. I do want to talk a bit about the process of becoming a writer, uh, because I've known you for some years and have watched you um, Become a becoming and publishing and, and, uh, and becoming known as a writer. And I asked you, and you've been such a good sport to agree to do this, to, to maybe illustrate that by bringing with you an early piece of writing that might be able to show sort of deconstructing your career as a writer back to the right. beginnings. I'm so compulsive, I actually save this. As, as you um, said, most writers usually burn this. They <laughs> burn anything like this that they could get a hold of. But I found an early, a very early story that I had written called The Desert, and I also found a very early rejection letter that <laughs> <laughs> came back with it from a now defunct magazine called Nuestro, the magazine for Latinos. Uh, and this is written by John Storm, wherever you are <laughs> today. <laughs> and it, it's uh, such a wonderful letter. He said, Dear Ms. Alcala, thank you for submitting your short story, The Desert, to us. You write extremely well. The opening dialogue strikes me as excellent. Unfortunately, the story goes flat once you get into the narrated past, <laughs> which is functionally necessary to explain your heroine's dilemma and decision, but is too long and static. And of course, I had the faintest idea what he was talking about. <laughs> what are you about. talking about? <laughs> because I hadn't really studied writing at that time. Um, it wasn't until 1984, I think, that I started in the master's program here at the university and, and received a master's degree in creative writing. Hmm. So I'll read you a little piece of this early story. Okay. Uh, this is a woman who stays up most of the night trying to decide if she should leave her husband and go do something useful with her life. She slept. She dreamed that she had a vision of a flying serpent and then had to go around the country preaching about it. She traveled from town to dusty town in an old school bus painted white with several people, including an old lady in a jersey dress who played the xylophone. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> They'd stop in a shabby desert town, set up a platform by the bus, and the people would shuffle out to stare at them. The sun was blinding hot. The old lady would play her xylophone, and then Joan would get up and tell about her vision of the flying serpent while sweat ran down her neck. The people were gray and listless. She could tell by their eyes, even the children's, that they had long since stopped caring about anything. It was up to her to make them care. She would talk to them as earnestly as she could, pleading with them through dry lips to listen to her. The heat rose in shimmering waves from the street beyond the gathering. 
like water sparkling in the distance. Sometimes a few people would look a little bit interested, but the look would fade and they would once again become dull and lifeless. They would put the xylophone and the platform back into the bus, drive hundreds of miles through the desert to the next town, and try again. She had to keep trying. What's funny, I, I, I laughed because it reminded me of, uh, I so, hey, kind of hate to admit this, but I used to love the show 30-something, and there was an episode in there where somebody was trying to become a writer. And without even really knowing why, you could always tell when somebody wasn't writing with their own voice, and that's what this whole story a was about. Voice. So to read this book and then to hear that piece, I could, it's like, well, who is that person? Who is Who's that person? With the xylophone and right. the surf, you know, all that kind <laughs> of stuff. But I think there are certain themes, right, that are still, <laughs> I'm still, she had to tell them uh, that but it you, that Even when you were through. reading it, it's like, that isn't really me. Right. You know, I was trying to find me. But I that think wasn't that's me. what writers do spend a long time doing. People tell you to do this and to do that. But one of the main things which you hear again and again and doesn't make sense until it happens is a writer has to find her own voice and has to be comfortable with the material that she's working with. So There's only so many school buses and xylophones <laughs> right, so and eccentrics you can work <laughs> in. How, how in, the, in the creative writing program at the university, you come in, you have talent, they've said, yes, you have promise as a writer. What do they do? I mean, I try to think of what's, what part is just the gift you have as a writer, and then what part are actually the tools of the trade, and how are you taught to put those together? Well, in my case, the nicest thing they did was indulge me, just encourage me to keep writing and trying to point out things that connected with the reader and things that didn't. And I think that that's something that a writer has to eventually internalize that a writing program can help you do, which is to be your own editor, to stand back and say, now is anyone else going to have the faintest idea of what I'm talking about once this is simply words on paper? Because in the end, that's all we have to work with are these little black marks on white paper. And we're not going to be there to explain what we were trying to do or thinking about at the time. No, you should like this right. because what I meant <laughs> If it's here not was in the text, it's not there. So um, I was really lucky at the time. Lois Hudson, who's now retired, I think most of my professors are now retired. <laughs> Lois Hudson was there, and Joanna Russ, who's a fabulous science fiction writer and feminist, and um, let's see, Colleen McElroy and Charles Johnson and Donna Gerstenberger, and they were all wonderful writers and wonderful people who helped me sort of shape my stories and also showed me that there were places to publish beside the New Yorker, which I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> sort of the grail right, for writers. Like, you, you either get a short story in the New Yorker or you don't, and one day Joanna Russ brought an assortment of, of small literary magazines to class and said, these are places where you can submit your work. And this was a revelation to me. One of the magazines she brought was Calix, a journal for women, or by women. And um, they were one of the first places that took a story that I wrote mm. and eventually published my first short story collection. You've also done teaching. You've done workshops and, yes. and, and taught. How, so you internalize that as a student and then repeat that experience right. for the student? I have to say that some people are a lot better at it than I am. A lot of it is the notion of uh, it helps to be a good speaker and, and charismatic because then people pay attention to what you're saying. But a lot of it, I, as I said before, is helping the student to internalize a lot of these things that you're telling them. One of the things that I, I think is interesting that I heard at early workshops, I was able to go to a workshop with Robert Stone out at Port Townsend at one point. He started the class by reading a short story by James Joyce out loud. He read Araby from the Dubliners. And of course he has this extraordinary voice, so it sounds great. But then he read it very slowly and with the right emphasis, and then he talked about the story. And then he, did, then he conducted the workshops for the rest of the week. And I think that reading well-written stories out loud does make a difference. It, it somehow affects your brain differently. And that if the beginning writer can then read their own work out loud and say to oneself, does this ring true? Is this a true voice? Then it helps a lot. And mm. it's a good way to, to 
write and then revise your work. It's like literally. There's something using about it's, hearing it's reaffirming, it. and yes. it either it's, it's honest and tells you. And if you, you feel funny reading your work out loud, then there's probably something wrong with it, and you need Be to find out what. Because there was a, a great right. difference in the way you read those two pieces. Right. Uh, in the introduction, I mentioned the fact that this is uh, a place where a lot of writers seem to be gathering, with sort of like the iron filings. It seems to be. <laughs> Do you have any idea why that's happening? I think that Seattle is a very welcoming place for writers. Um, when I first got interested in writing, let's see, um, I worked a short time in Los Angeles. I was a, an assistant, a production assistant for a documentary unit at KNBC. I said, oh, I'm interested in writing, and people said, oh, well, you should do a screenplay. And someone plopped down a screenplay on my desk, and some horrible slasher movie. <laughs> I said, this is really, a lot of people are interested in this property. And I said, no, I don't think that's what I should be doing. <laughs> and then I worked off and on in Washington, D.C. And um, there's always use for a good writer if you can write a press release, you can do research. And so I developed those skills. But if you said, well, I want to write fiction, I want to write stories, people just didn't know what to do with that. It wasn't considered um, a viable profession. But in Seattle, if you say, well, I'm a writer, I'm interested in writing, inevitably people will say, oh, well, I'm writing a novel, too. <laughs> <laughs> Charles Johnson tells a story about running into someone at 2 a.m. in the local supermarket using the copy machine, and that person said, oh, well, I'm writing a novel, too. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what does it mean in terms of your profession and your, to you as a writer to be surrounded with all these other... I think it's wonderful. One of the things that I've been able to do... Um, is help other writers, both working as an assistant editor at the Seattle Review, but also in helping to found the Raven Chronicles in 1991. Um, I felt that I could offer a venue for writers looking for a place to have their works published. And we've been able to, to publish new writers next to very well-established writers like Tess Gallagher and um, Sherman Alexi, and so give their work a little bit more exposure than it would have otherwise. Um, I'm happy to say that a number of people who first published with us are now having their first books come out, and it's like, I feel so proud mm. <laughs> to help that. And you can feel proud of, of your own first yes. novel. It's really quite wonderful. Thank you. It's called Spirits of the Ordinary. Kathleen Alcala, thank you for being a guest on Upon Reflection, and best wishes. Thank you. To see more UWTV classics, visit uwtv.org slash classics.